This is a mechanism of disease map for lung cancer. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations for lung cancer. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right. Let's go ahead and get started. First, the central pathophysiology of lung cancer. And remember, this is a pretty high-level overview. Lung cancer is an abnormal proliferation of cells, and this results in several different subtypes of lung cancer. First, you have the neuroendocrine tumors. This includes small cell lung cancer and bronchial carcinoid tumor. Next, there are the non-small cell lung cancers. This includes most prominently the squamous cell carcinoma, as well as the lung adenocarcinoma. Now, it's worth noting that this list is not exhaustive. These are the most um, prominent ones that are most likely to show up on the board exams and that have some strong associations with them. Next, let's work our way back to the etiologies of lung cancer. The most common one that we probably all know about is tobacco smoking. This is associated with 80 to 90% of lung cancers, and the risk is determined by the number of pack years that the person has smoked. So for instance, if somebody has smoked one pack of cigarettes a day for one year, they have a one pack year history. If they've smoked one pack of cigarettes a day for 10 years, that's a 10 pack year history. If they've smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for 10 years, that's a 20 pack year history. Now tobacco smoking is most strongly associated with squamous cell carcinoma and small cell lung cancer. So you can remember that tobacco smoking is more strongly associated with squamous cell carcinoma and small cell lung cancer. They all have that same S sound. And these are actually all found centrally within the lungs. So smoking cancers are found most centrally. Also has the S sound, even though it starts with the letter C. Some other etiologies of lung cancer, family history predisposes you to lung cancer um, in general. If parent or uh, other close relative has lung cancer, you might be predisposed to it. There are some specific mutations that predispose you to lung adenocarcinoma. These include mutations in the EGFR gene, the ALK gene, and the KRAS gene, K-R-A-S gene. Next, exposure to other carcinogens outside of tobacco smoking can also predispose you to lung cancer. For instance, one occupational hazard is uranium. In minors, they have exposure to radon decay, which predisposes you to small cell lung cancer. Other carcinogens include passive smoking, so like secondhand smoke, asbestos exposure, occupations that work with arsenic, chromium, nickel, beryllium, and silica. Um, sometimes this is manufacturing or material science industries, and environmental air pollution. All of those can generally predispose you to lung cancer. Prior radiation can predispose you to lung cancer as well, as well as pulmonary scarring or pulmonary fibrosis. And this comes from a variety of etiologies. They can be inflammatory, they can be infectious, they can just be structural factors that lead to pulmonary fibrosis can all predispose you to lung cancer. Lastly, chronic pulmonary infections like tuberculosis or HIV leading to PCP pneumonia can cause pulmonary fibrosis, which cause lung cancer, but can also directly predispose you to lung cancer. Next, we'll talk about the manifestations. We'll start with the pulmonary symptoms of lung cancer, and some of these might be kind of obvious. You can have a cough, and this can be with or without hemoptysis. Hemoptysis is a cough that is bloody. So bloody or non-bloody cough can indicate lung cancer. Progressive dyspnea or shortness of breath, wheezing, and chest pain can all result from lung cancer. There are also some extra pulmonary manifestations. This includes manifestations of many cancers like weight loss, fever, weakness, and this usually signals advanced disease. If the lung cancer gets big enough and has a mass effect on the SVC, the superior vena cava, it can impair venous backflow to the right atria, and this results in SVC syndrome, where you have venous congestion in the head, the neck, and the upper extremities, which can lead to swelling in those extremities, in the head and the neck as well. You can have a mass effect on the recurrent laryngeal nerve, causing a recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, which can lead to hoarseness, makes somebody sound like they have a sore throat. You can have a phrenic nerve palsy from mass effect as well. This can result in dyspnea, or shortness of breath, as well as diaphragmatic elevation. You might see this on a chest x-ray. You can have a malignant pleural effusion in really bad cases of lung cancer. This can result in dullness to percussion of the chest, as well as decreased breath sounds. And again, this is usually a pretty bad sign for lung cancer. It's oftentimes considered incurable when you have a pleural effusion this bad.
You can have esophageal compression as well, which can result in dysphagia or difficulty and pain with swallowing. And you can also have a mass effect on the airway, which can lead to a couple downstream effects, including lung atelectasis and secretion stasis. Both of this can predispose you to bacterial colonization, uh, sorry, bacterial colonization, which can then cause subsequent infections of the lung. So this is called a post-obstructive pneumonia. So you can have lung cancer that blocks your bacteria from getting out and um, causes pneumonia from that. Lastly, there are some perineoplastic syndromes that are worth knowing. This box will have perineoplastic syndromes that stem from small cell lung cancer, or SCLC, and this box will have perineoplastic syndrome from non-small cell lung cancers. And you can see that there is some overlap. First, the perineoplastic syndromes of small cell lung cancers. This includes Lambert-Eaton syndrome, Cushing syndrome, which you might first diagnose by having a really, really high cortisol or the uh, manifestations of high cortisol, high steroid on the body, and syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion or SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Those are all perineoplastic syndromes of small cell lung cancer. The perineoplastic syndromes of non-small cell lung cancer include hypercalcemia of malignancy, which is most commonly seen in squamous cell lung cancer, um, thrombophlebitis migraines and non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis is most commonly seen in lung adenocarcinoma. Any of these non-small cell lung cancers can cause this hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, as well as uh, which I guess causes clubbing of the fingers and toes, as well as swelling in the pain, uh, swelling and pain in the joints and bones. Lastly, some common perineoplastic syndrome for both of these include cachexia and wasting, dermatomyositis thrombocytosis, hypercoagulability, and DIC, and lastly, acanthosis nigricans. This has been a video on lung cancer. I hope it was helpful. 